Um, Joanne Wilson. Um, I'm an angel investor. I've been doing it for a couple of years. I also have a blog called Gotham Gal. Uh, I also put on a conference, um, a big proponent of women, called the Women's Entrepreneur Festival with the ITP department of uh, NYU last year, which we're doing again this January. And um, that's it. So uh, <laughs> just a little bit about me. My name is Mo Koifman. I am a an investor at Spark Capital, which is a, a venture firm out of Boston, and I, I help lead our efforts here in New York. Um, we, uh, you know, start with the consumer and, and kind of work our way backwards from there, but spend a lot of time in uh, web and mobile services, um, investors in a lot of companies, I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard of, from Twitter to Tumblr to Foursquare to more recently Skillshare and, and others. Um, and, um, you know, pretty active investors in the space. Uh, and before that, I uh, worked at a company called IAC where we, you know, was involved on the acquisition side, incubating a bunch of businesses and ultimately uh, running companies such as College Humor and Vimeo and Busted Tees with the, with the founders there. Um, that's a little bit about me and maybe Joe, tell a little bit about what you're interested in and I'll do the same. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I mean, really through my blog, I've been kind of a chick magnet, and a lot of women come to me with their businesses, which is fantastic. I wish um, I did that as well. <laughs> but, um, you know, I also, I also see men too. Um, and, you know, I've um, spent a lot of time, um, some of the companies that I'm invested in right now um, is Food52, Catch a Fire, Nestio, um, and um, Red Stamp, t to name a few. And so, um, I'm very involved investor, and I get to see a lot of different things every day, which is a hell of a lot of fun because it allows, I think for both Mo and I, the more people you see and the more companies that come to you, it gives you a really good idea of the landscape of what's going on in the startup industry um, because, you know, when one person has a one great idea, there's generally about five of them roughly in the same category somewhere else in the world. And so what I like to see, I see a lot of um, content businesses, um, and certainly a lot of content businesses now they're trying to figure out an e-commerce play. Um, I do a lot of stuff in the food industry, which I really like. And, um, you know, uh, those are really two of the areas that I'm in, in, you know, that I like, but I'm open to pretty much anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So well, actually, the the, we, mm -hmm. we initially met um, through, you know, the combination of food and the media business. We sat on a board. Yeah, sat on a board mm -hmm. and Angel invested in a, in a company together. And uh, that, those are areas, obviously, that I'm, I'm very interested in as well, although I largely do that stuff outside of Spark mm -hmm. because we are focused on um, really, you know, classically scalable, technology enabled, yeah, exactly, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. internet uh, and mobile mm -hmm. platforms. So I spend a lot of time these days, I, I'm, I'm obsessed by marketplace businesses and anything that exhibit marketplace dynamics on the web. That's kind of my first order and large, large networks um, on the web. Um, I uh, am a big fan of e-commerce and always have been uh, and continue to look for investments there. Uh, very bullish, obviously, on the mobile platform and the tablet platform and look for investments that are very native to those platforms. Um, and um, uh, there was something else we were talking about earlier. And now what I'd we look at. I mean, I think that the, what I'm excited about is seeing all these businesses, and actually some of them I've seen before here, is that... Um, you know, the startup industry is a fantastic industry to be in, particularly in New York City today, because New York City is such a myriad of different businesses. Just because you're in food or you're in fashion or you're in, you know, data dumps, at the end of the day, it's just the web is your platform. And so, you know, Mo and I get the incredible luck of meeting super smart people every day and, you know, hoping that they're going to create economies in New York City and obviously you know, a, a global economy eventually. So, you know, I'm psyched to see the companies that are yeah. out there today. And two last things I, I recall that I kind of wanted to mention. One is uh, a vertical focus that I, I've been spending a lot of time on, which is in the education space and just thinking about how that space is going to be revolutionized by many of the disruptive trends that the internet and, and mobile platforms bring. Um, and lastly, just this concept of uh, online to offline that we were talking mm -hmm. about, you know, how the the actual world, the physical world, kind of jives with the online and the virtual world and how those things kind of work together um, in some very interesting now. ways. So, you know, those are, I think, a bunch of the areas that we're interested in. There's certainly some overlap, but also some things that are, are unique to what we focus on. So. 
Hopefully that's helpful. We're good. We have 18 seconds remaining. Look at that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. And They'll be back here in just one hour. If you want to go check out the startups, they are right behind you. Thank you all very much. So I think uh, we chose a couple of, um, couple of the companies that we saw today that we wanted to highlight, kind of based on uh, what we mentioned earlier that we're looking for and, and the ones that we found uh, you know, most uh, uh, appropriate and compelling in that context. So. The first one is um, a company called Freshocracy. Um, and um, you know what we really liked about uh, this company is first and foremost the the passion of the entrepreneur for the space, which I think is fundamentally important in, in any startup. Um, secondly, obviously, it's in the, in the food space, which is something that's near and dear to both of our hearts, but it also is capitalizing on a whole host of trends, one of which is um, bringing you know, farm-to-table, fresh, fresh farmed food directly to the end user and the whole CSA movement in this country and tapping into that. I think it's also helping stem confusion about you know, what to make, how to make it, you know, how, the, the amount of ingredients, et cetera, et cetera. And they Pardon really me there, Mo. Real quick. Freshocracy, are you here? This is your Oprah moment. Come join us on stage. That's this. Sure. So I'll just, I'll keep, I'll give you a few more things while they're coming up. Uh, and then I'm sure we'll have some time to ask them questions, et cetera, right? Yes. Um, so they'll, they'll talk for about one minute, just kind of explain their concept, and then you guys will talk great. for a little while. And, and so just, you know, th to make it simple, make it easy to make great fresh food um, and take all the thinking out of it uh, is a great, great promise. And the biggest question that we have is simply on the economics of the model and how it scales, but I'm sure we'll get into that. Jump. Jump right in. I think you can sit if you like you or stand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Thank you. This is an honor. Mm -hmm. We're very excited mm -hmm. about this. So uh, we're all going to ask ourselves this question today, what's for dinner tonight? It's something we ask ourselves every day, in fact. But the problem is we're all busy professionals. We have social lives. We have busy family lives. And convenience is of the utmost importance. So we came up with a business model which thought, can you fast forward this? <laughs> if we can bring the green market to the people, take the planning and the shopping out of the equation, then we can bring a convenient service to New Yorkers. We have an online subscription model. All you do is go through a three-step process. You choose the number of servings you want, a two-hour delivery window, and then we're going to show up at your door every other Sunday with all the ingredients, the recipe cards to make those meals, portioned out, including the spices. You need nothing else. The result, beautiful and exciting farm-to-table meals that you can be proud of. Next one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we launched this past spring, and since then, we've delivered over 3,000 meals to New Yorkers. Um, we have an ongoing online conversation. People are proud of what they're doing. They're posting to Facebook. We plan to continue to leverage that to continue to grow the business. Um, and it looks like time is up, so I'll leave it open to questions. Awesome. You know, one of the things I really like about Freshocracy, and I'm looking you know, at your little chart here, is that as the farm to table becomes more important in everyone's lives, right? Is that you can really take this and you can, I think there's a huge scalable opportunity, not only in Queens or Brooklyn, but also from large companies such as a Whole Foods that wants to take your concept and roll it out to their customers, right? So I think everyone is interested in cooking a wonderful meal and having wonderful products in their refrigerator, getting them there and being able to do that is a really disconnect, right? So what you're doing is you're actually providing um, the food, the recipes, and everything measured out so you can become brilliant to your family or whoever co you're cooking for that day. Um, but again, this goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, which is there's, some, there's a, um, a very big trend that's going on which between what's going on in the web and what's going on from an old school perspective, right? So, you know, going to the green market, taking your bag home, you go online, you put your information on, and then something comes in. So you, even though it's not a web business, you still are using the web as a platform to grow your business. 
Absolutely, and I think the important thing is that conversation that happens after people have prepared these meals, because it's not just cooking as a task, it's an experience, and there's a lot of pride in our customers. Either they're new to cooking in the kitchen, or they've tried something that they've never prepared before, and sharing that among a community of like-minded people who are either foodies or you know new moms who just need the, that convenience, um, helps our business, but also gets people interested in food again, in the food systems. And we'll have that conversation with the farmers, and then we want our customers having the conversation about what it is to cook a, a good, fresh meal. Yep. And so, um, you know, we, we love uh, the concept here, and the biggest question that, that we both had is just, how do, you, how do you make this a really big business? I think Joanne just mentioned something that's interesting in that context. Um, and I wonder if it's anathema to you and, and whether you'd ever do it, frankly, um, which is w what if you could, because I think one of the biggest innovations here is put the farm to table piece aside for a minute, even though I love the farm to table piece. I think the idea of like making it so much easier for people to plan, measure out and prepare amazing meals is that's a really hard thing, especially with, you know, uh, both parents working and the whole, it's just really, really challenging. Um, I wonder if you could ever do it where you, you put us, and, and by the way, the thing, one of the things I love about this business is a subscription model. So it changes the customer acquisition dynamics, the lifetime value equation, and your ability to acquire customers profitably, you know, uh, is, is, is significantly improved. So my question is, what if you front a Whole Foods or, you know, any, anybody else in a neighborhood that, and you could actually pick from their inventory, exactly. the things that are freshest and from the farm or whatever, and it can spare you some of the logistical headaches of having to deal with all the farms, you don't have infrastructure in the delivery, et cetera, and actually solve the biggest problem on the front end first, and over time you could do more with the farms and scale as you obviously grow and, and get more volume, I think you could do more in terms of the purest farm to table concept. Yeah, I think it's something that we both agree on and, and this is a logistics business, so thinking about this at scale re requires us to solve some of those problems. You know, we started this with a rental car going to the green market and developing those relationships and we have extremely good relationships. Our farmers brought us food on the hurricane weekend so we could still deliver to our customers. But they're small farms. They can't market themselves. They don't have the time. If they're going to grow and scale with us, you know, they need to not be spending the time selling their product. And so with those relationships, we could go to someone like a Whole Foods and really change the way that we're getting food to people by sourcing, you know, even the pantry items, their bulk section, and leveraging all the infrastructure that they have in place and the food that they're, you know, already getting distributed to them. Yeah, because I, mean, I, I think if you solve the front end problem, which is, you know, the consumer, if you, if you, if you can acquire enough consumers by taking the hassle out of making great, fresh cooked, organic, whatever meals, um, you know, you could work your way back through the chain, I think, more easily. I mean, it's a little bit, you know, the margin won't quite be there because Whole Foods is damn expensive to begin with, right? So you're not gonna get that wholesale price, but, but you may be able to prove to them that you're driving, I mean, and their margins are so thin anyway. So it, it's really just a way to get mm -hmm. the agree. flywheel turning a little bit. Um, and they're trying uh, to become more local too. Mm -hmm. They're trying to push towards a huge percentage of their business being local, yeah. although The only that's issue the there is they have no margin, too. right? Right, so it's like not making they're never gonna be able to, they're on. making a 3% margin on the bottom right. line anyways, maybe they're doing four or five. But, but you know, I, mean, I think there's another piece of here which is really important is, is, the, um, is the recipes and the cooking, right? There's a book that just came out this week of course, I can't remember the name of the author or the name of the book, but um, nine, this woman who actually wrote another book before it, um, The Sharper Your Knives, The More You Cry. Did you read about this? And she basically has nine people that she teaches how to, she goes through their cabinets, she cleans their cabinets, she teaches them how to cook, right? And these, you know, how to cut open, how to cut a chicken, how to peel an egg that's been hard boiled. And I think that that's one of the issues is that in the world that we live in today with fast food and what have you not, people, feel uncomfortable cooking in their kitchen. They don't know what they're doing. I mean, there is certainly plenty that do, but I mean, there's plenty of the frill that if they do it wrong, it's gonna kill somebody. Many of them are our customers, honestly. Yes. We get that <laughs> feedback where they did not even know, you know, well, what certain tools were, and they'll send us an email and ask. So they are novices. We have certainly the people that are the foodies too, but um, 
you know, they feel very comfortable because we're telling them what to do. They just follow the 10 That's steps. That's awesome. How many, how many meals do you get in each, every two weeks? You get three meals. And we did that strategically because we wanted this to feel like something people could commit to. And then well, miss in us in the off week. Sense. Yeah. And three meals, but they'll stay fresh for the whole two weeks, so you need to... For the most part, but we also provide a one-pager about where all of your food was sourced and how to keep it fresh. So if something's only going to keep you uh, freeze you know, a few it or days, whatever, or we'll like. encourage people, if you're not going to cook the fish in two to three days, freeze it and then defrost it. Right. Um, but you know, most of our produce is harvested the day before we get it. Right, so that's You fine. think about a grocery chain, no, it's going to no. travel across country. I'm it's just thinking about meat and fish for you and stuff too like is that how many people are going to be packing these things, right? It's labor intensive what you're doing. It is. Mm -hmm. I mean, that to me is the biggest question here is just the unit economics and the, you know, the logistics of this. And I'm, I'm thinking in my head already of like, you know, how do you get the cost right so that you can manage the infrastructure and what can you do to shortcut that in the near term, still deliver on the consumer promise, but, you know, work your way towards true, like we're going to literally go farm to table end-to-end -end solution over time. So, you know, I'd love to dig in a little more on that with you guys. Okay. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you both. And the next company? Elect next. <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> So you want to give a little bit about you know what, what you liked about yeah. this, what we liked about this? You know, of course we were sent all the companies so before we got here. So I spent some time like looking at all the websites and what everybody was doing and sort of getting a better idea of what each of your companies did before we got here because certainly you know a three second presentation is not exactly the easiest thing to get your arms around or understand what the entrepreneur is trying to do or who the entrepreneur is. But there was something about this site that I found interesting um, because I think that one of the biggest problems um, in terms of elections is that I'm not so sure people, I think people react to the candidate as a brand, not so much what the candidate believes in. And there was something appealing to me as I went through this whole process of being asked a million questions and saying, here's who you should be voting for. I mean, I wasn't surprised, but I think a lot of people would be surprised. I think we'd have a better and a cleaner election. I was surprised because I did the whole thing and said I should be voting for you. <laughs> 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 so anyway, um, you want to ask us some, some questions? Sure. Do I go through? Do we go through? Oh, yeah, you guys yeah, you do your go thing, your thing and, and then, then we ask we'll, questions. We'll right. go through the questions. Mm -hmm. All right, great. So just to set the stage a little bit, um, it's election day, and you're at the polls, ready to rock the vote until you walk into the ballot booth, and you see something like this. It's three pages long. You're expected to vote for something like insurance commissioner, and you don't know what to do. And that's precisely where Elect Next comes in. So the idea. Uh, is that we're building for you eHarmony for your elections. We ask you which issues are most important to you, where you stand on those issues, and then based on your location, we can pull up all of your candidates and show you how you uniquely align to those candidates. Um, so as people come to elect next and we help each of you make voting decisions, we are also gaining a unique perspective on the national political preference landscape. That's a four, uh, $8 billion a year industry. Um, that is trying to access exactly that, people's voting preferences. So um, I'm Kaya Danabaum. I come from the world of politics. My co-founder, Paul Jungworth, brings the tech, and we're really excited to help all of you vote well in 2012. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, that was the most interesting, right? So when I did it, you know, you put in your zip code where you're from, and then a bunch of candidates that, you're right, when you get there, like you're voting for these judges, and it's like, I know nothing about these seven judges. Right. And so they t told me which judge I should vote for. I think, you know, it certainly resonates with us and, and probably with everybody here, just that um, there's a lot of ignorance in this country and beyond in terms of, like, you know, who we're voting for, what people actually believe in. You know, we get swayed more by television commercials and, you know, you know what, your, what your parents might have done or what your peers are doing. And, you know, even if you don't necessarily 
come out of this saying, oh cool, it told me who to vote for, but you just come out of it saying, oh cool, I know that that candidate, you know, their perspective or his or her perspective most aligns with my perspective. I think that's a very, very important tool and certainly, you know, in your process and certainly for the tertiary kind of candidates, whether it's a, you know, local judge or whatever it is where you just frankly don't know, I think, I think this solves an ignorance problem. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know how you make uh, money? Yeah, well, I, I think you could figure it out. I, I almost don't care if this business makes right. money. Like, meaning the criteria for this, for us, is I almost see this as more of a public service than, than I do a business. I'm sure you could find ways to monetize it, but I'd almost, it's almost like, I wish it was a nonprofit and it was just like, think before you act. Right. And it was mm -hmm. like, know before you vote. Mm -hmm. And you really, because the, the biggest thing here is what, you know, the data. Like, what is the data on on the back end, by the way, I know there's money in politics in terms of, you know, uh, polling and special interests and whatever, but I almost want this to be pure, you know what I mean? I almost want it to just be, we're here to make yeah. sure that people in this country actually vote for the folks who represent what they believe in. Right. Do you know what I mean? Their interests. I'm just curious, how do you guys come up with those questions, right? So, you know, it's like we that, all that's know. That's my big yeah, question is, well. is data is so, you know, manipulative, Squishy. yes. <laughs> So where did you come up with those questions? But that's How our, did you and do that, by that? the way, for, for me too, that is the biggest question we have is just, you know, it's all fine and good and it sounds great, but it's only good if the answers actually are the right answers, mm -hmm. which involves you getting the right data into the system and make sure you ask the right questions. So, you know, hard for us to gauge that and we really, I think, both wanted to understand how, how that happens. Sure. So um, just a, a bit of backstory is um, the site has been live for about three weeks. Mm -hmm. So we are a very young company and a lot of this stuff we're, we are figuring out as we go along. Um, but to answer your question on where the questions came from, um, we used as a basis um, Gallup and Pew um, political polls. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of our baseline for topics as well as phrasing. And then we have advisors to the project who are um, running the Polling Institute at Harvard um, uh, and out of the political science department at Princeton, so survey analysis experts. So they sort of help us gauge kind of are we actually writing these questions in a way that professional survey experts find neutral and unbiased. Yeah. Um, and then the other side of that, you know, how do we populate the site um, with the information that we need to do the matching? Um, right now we pull data from five different sources to sort of triangulate where we think each candidate stands on each of the questions that we ask you. That is, the candidates are invited to the platform to answer the questions directly themselves. We do a statement scrape with a bit of in-house curation to just sort of figure out what they're saying and where they land. Um, there's a crowdsource component, so voters can tell us where they think candidates stand. Along with the citation, there's an expert source component, same idea, and then we use interest group ratings, um, which helps us get at sort of voting record type data to infer where candidates stand, and we compile that, um, and then we have one data point that we use for the matching. Interesting. Great. For each candidate. And so, if you do think about this commercially, how, how, I mean, do you imagine like it comes out and says I should vote for Mitt Romney and all of a sudden Mitt Romney has a, an election ad next to it? Or, I mean, is that, is that how, how it, you see it unfolding? So we're a little bit philosophically opposed to advertising. That's kind why of <laughs> what you were getting at is that we, we really are mission driven and we see this largely as a public service and advertising can very much interfere with that mission. So um, right now we're looking at the unique content that we're drawing together as well as the functionality that we're presenting and looking to License is maybe not the right word, but sort of white label the content and functionality to online publishers. Um, think regional news media, political bloggers, people who are looking to engage their readership around elections in a new and interesting way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's would sort you of sell our first it back cut. to politicians? Um, like, would you say to them, "Hey, in the you know one zero zero, it turns out you actually have a lot of supporters, or in the one zero zero one three, you know, zip code, and you should." You know, give them real detail. Don't spend reports. any time there because they're already voting for yeah, you. Yeah, or that, or go spend time here because you're yeah. losing, but you actually think you're winning. And yes, um, once we have a user base and we of scale, we, right? of scale, then we think that we can offer data in aggregate to right. campaigns, interest groups, um, you know, various organizations. So that you are can looking feed the promote. beast at that point. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now for the community-selected startup, 
please welcome Social Passport. Narrowly beating out Freshocracy, I'd like to add. Interesting. Hi, thank you again for uh, accepting us. We really do appreciate it. Um, a little bit about Social Passport. Uh, what we've done is we created a solution for businesses to leverage the full power of social media in real time. And when people get home at the end of the day or when they get back to their desk at work, but while they're still at the store and while they're still at the event, users can go ahead and, um, oops, P uh, users can go ahead and basically have a kind of like a Lord of the Rings of social media, one barcode or one app to rule them all. And basically, they can have their Facebook, their Foursquare, their Twitter in one solution, which they can go to a store window, go to uh, a register, tap it, and instantly have the options to check in, uh, like, follow, etc. Businesses have the ability to also offer in these Q in in the uh, in the delivery of this solution barcodes which will lead to coupons which they can leverage their social media networks and communicate their product and service to your entire network of friends and family. So that's a little bit about Social Passport. Great. So how is this different than Foursquare? It is Foursquare. It's Foursquare faster and it's Foursquare for everybody. Um, you come to a window and you want to check in at Foursquare, you don't have to turn on your GPS and you certainly don't even have to uh, basically open up your app and then find the location. But isn't it easier to turn on your GPS or just check into Foursquare than use a barcode scanner? Yeah, but what happens if they want to get a coupon and get 20% off at that store? How are you aggregating the uh, discounts? Well, basic, how am I aggregating the discounts? How are you getting discounts into the platform? Oh, so basically all the merchants have access to a mer uh, back-end suite, a social media suite, where they can log in and upload all their discounts, all their incentives. They can deploy loyalty card platforms, coupons, etc. cetera. And, and are they tied to individual users, or are they an aggregate? Uh, they are tied to the individual users as well, the coupons themselves. So in essence, it's an application on your phone. You walk in, and you don't even have to do anything. It's just there. Right. You basically just tap your phone. Well, no, you have to either scan, scan a bar, the phone. barcode or right. use NFC. Look, the biggest so, problem I, yeah. I had on sure. that, to your question, is that most people don't, even geeks yeah. don't use barcodes. That's, it's, it's been a problem, right? You know, it's just, it just I don't, you know, from, as a delivery mechanism, I, I think, or as, a, um, as a, a way into the service, I think it's tough. Um, so that's, I, on the front end, I struggle with that. I, but I think, may, look, maybe you can solve that and... Um, maybe NFC will make it easier, although it's largely not quite yet deployed at scale. Um, but well, that, that's been, that was like my biggest problem on the front end. But mm -hmm. then, and we can talk about that. Sure, but when absolutely. You, when you get into it, you know, I, I, other than Foursquare, you know, the Facebook data, the Twitter data, and, and by the way, you know, we're investors in Twitter and Foursquare. And sure. jo Joanne is too, de facto. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, I just, I'm not quite sure how relevant any, uh, like all that data, it sounds good, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera, but I'm not quite sure it really gets you much when you're at the venue. Meaning Foursquare I understand because it's all about that, that venue, but I mean the tweets about the coffee shop that I'm at, I mean how interesting is that? I, I don't quite know. Now the loyalty mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. I do understand, mm -hmm. but then you know, if we strip away the noise and say, you know, we know who you are because you signed up for the, for the program and you can get delivered an offer from the merchant. I mean, I get that, but now we're in Groupon, Living Social, and I can go down the list of 100 companies that are all playing in that territory, including Foursquare, and then I just get a little worried about, you know, how do you compete right. in that, in that my, space? Yeah, and the issue with the tap is, okay, let's say that the next Foursquare model is, is they continue to change the business model as they're learning from their community. You walk into your local coffee shop or your restaurant or wherever you are, and you pull out your phone and it says, oh, you're here, hit here, you checked in. You don't even have to do anything, right? No tap, no nothing. I mean, I'm a big believer in um, many companies in many spaces and competition is good, but you know, my concern is that they're so far along the line, right? versus someone just entering that space. Okay, so let me address all these things. First of all, we're not competing with Foursquare. We are Foursquare. We're not competing with Twitter. We are Twitter. We're simply them faster. To answer your question about QR. I don't understand what that means. Okay, basically, if you have all your social media in one place, in one app. You're aggregating it. 
Where are you aggregating? You're aggregating. We're it. aggregating it for you. We're putting it in a, pla a single place, just like you aggregate a lot of things, like loyalty cards. There's a lot of loyalty cards that you aggregate in one solution. But here's the most important part. You know, when you looked at, when you mentioned your thing about QR codes before, that's because that's traditional QR, which is boring. When you download contact information, it's irrelevant. When you're pushing someone to a web page, it's irrelevant. You're getting calendar event. So yes, you're right. It is boring. But that's not what our thing was. Our thing is called dynamic QR, where the Bert Merchant does ne never has to reprint the, bar the signage in his store window. Through our system, he can constantly deliver an endless amount of media through that barcode and actually leverage social media. There's not a single barcode today that when you scan, you can instantly click and like. I don't want to go and open up Twitter, find the Twitter feed, then follow it. I don't want to go in and turn on my GPS, find the location, and then uh, uh, um, you know check in. And here's the thing about in terms of living social. Retail businesses cannot afford to give 50% discount and cannot afford to I give 50%. Mm -hmm. I, came, I come from 20 years growing up in a retail business and I have to tell you something, businesses cannot afford to totally do that. Agree. So what we've I done is- I don't get those is, businesses. Exactly. Yeah. I, I so by, the short term as far as exactly. I'm concerned. Exactly. So by lever mm -hmm. leveraging the visitor's social media network, yes, you're right. What does it do for you beyond, no, it's not tweeting, it's not that, it's the fact of the matter is, as I said, I'm gonna give you 20% off today at Nathan's, but I want you to click this post and on your wall, I in turn posted, I just got 20% off at Nathan's, click here and get your 20% and now your 800 friends see that and now I've given every business, every retail business, an ability to come into those stores and droves without the discount requirements yeah. or the commissions. I understand, I understand your point on the 50% and the problems with all those yeah. businesses out there and I think there's something to do in that space, although it's gonna be incredibly competitive. I just, for me, the struggle is still on the way and I don't, I don't, I have a hard time seeing the need for all the social media in one place and sitting on top of these services, I think is easier said than done. So that, that's my struggle sure. with it, okay. but you know, I'd love to, yeah. uh, I'd love to be proven wrong. Well, yeah, definitely come out to the expo coming out in November at Javits Center. We were just right. at the Small Business Expo and the whole idea was that these people came and they only got 200 visitors at their booth. But using Social Passport, they were able to turn that to over 150,000 people who great. learned about their product or service. That's, That's awesome. great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank you to all the startups that participated. Thank you to our two wonderful judges. Any parting words? Good luck to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think starting a startup, even if you succeed or you fail, you know, it's like getting a small MBA and it will take it wherever you go. If it means three of you merge together and create something different, I'm a huge believer in the startup industry. I think it's going to change the economy in New York and change the economy in this country. So go, go, go. What she said. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm.